Welcome to YouTube's first in-depth hard mode top guide. In this video, we will cover everything from current metas when learning, role responsibilities, gear setups, where to find teams, requirements, and more. If you look at the breakdown on your screen, you can find each section and the timestamps associated. Starting off with the requirements. For gear, you will require a scythe, bandos gear, 99 in all combat stats, and other associated strength gear. It is a good rule of thumb to have a 48 max hit with the scythe, achievable with an infernal cape or torva armor. At the bare minimum, your scythe's max hit when potted should be 47, but 48 does offer a substantial DPS boost. You will require a Dragon Warhammer and a BGS, a Crystal Halberd and Dragon Claws, a Blowpipe, although a Tebow is preferred, a Trident or a Sane Staff, not a Tumican Shadow, Major should have either Ancestral or Void, void Mage with the Fortified Ward. A Kodai or a Toxic Staff of the Dead as a Barrage weapon is a hard requirement. Rangers require Black Chins and a Buckler. Melees require a Swift Blade or a Ham Joint, although if you're an Iron Man, just a regular Whip or a Rapier will suffice. If you come in with less than this, you can still complete the raid, but you may have a harder time finding teams. At its core, a Scythe, Blowpipe, Bandos, a Defense Lowering Weapon, Trident, Rigor, Blowpipe, and 99 in the Attack, Strength, Mage, and Range stats alongside a Crystal Halberd are all hard requirements. Every spellbook should be unlocked. Skill Requirements You have to understand how defense reduction works with the Dragon Warhammer and BGS. I'll be going over spec metas later in the video for each room. Getting stuff to zero defense is essentially required. You should have a good understanding of the tick system. As a, a freezer, you should be able to freeze Maiden on a very consistent basis. This means your melee freezer, or North Major, uh, needs to be able to hit North 1, 2, 3, and 4. Yes, 4s as well. This requires being tick perfect. South needs to be able to help out with some DPS and still hit South 1, 2, 4. There are other micro-efficiencies that is covered in another video that's in the description. You need to be able to avoid being drained at Maiden. This is called bow flicking. It's very, very helpful. If you don't know how to do this, you're just going to have to be able to burn a super combat dose during Maiden. And you're going to need to be able to dodge blood in advance. For bloat, you need to be able to dodge hands and flies in bloat while also maximizing your damage. This means having an okay understanding of bloat's 32 tick cycle uh, and just lining up the number of scythes and chalies and claws to be able to compensate. You'll also want to be able to just conserve your run energy. For the nylos, you just want to be competent. You have to know some of your pre-fires, you have to be able to recognize certain wave milestones, and you just don't want to burn a lot of ticks. For so to say, you just need to be able to tick eat, and you just need to be able to run the maze uh, accurately and fast. For Zarpus, all you need to be able to do is melee Zarpus. You can 5.3 tick, or you can 5 tick. Either's fine. 5 ticks preferred, but if you can't do it, don't worry, you'll get it. For Verzik P1, you just need to be able to do it without being hit. For Verzik P2, you have to be good at not getting bounced, you have to be able to dodge crabs, and you have to be cognizant enough to not lure them into your teammates. And then for Verzik P3, this is the real test. You need to be able to tank, and you need to be able to tank well. You need to recognize when webs is happening, because webs is crucial to the success of the raid. And you need to be able to dodge your purple tornado extremely well while maintaining your overhead prayers. Finding teams. If this seems intimidating, just make sure you spend the time now learning the mechanics. If you spend 50 TOBs with the goal of improving all of this, you will absolutely be prepared for hard mode TOB. I've included three resources in the description that form the foundation of becoming an advanced and proficient TOBber. September's Advanced TOB Guide, the Oz TOB Discord, and the We Do Raids Advanced TOB Guide. Within We Do Raids, you can also find a text version of the hard mode TOB Guide. It is recommended that you master the TOB foundational mechanics before moving on to hard mode TOB. If you move on and you do not have consistent mastery of these mechanics, you will struggle finding teams. There is a very small amount of hard mode TOB learners and you will be excluded from them very quickly if you keep messing up. There are only a few people within the community who teach hard mode TOB on a regular basis, one being the Twitch streamer Sam Squanch, there's a few TOB mentors within the Ouija Raids community, and then there's just a few other individuals within Ouija Raids as well. 
Typically, we do raids is where most people tend to find teams, especially as a learner. You've been warned. You want to become the person who carries and not the anchor on the team. If you're able to carry, you'll find yourself getting good and consistent teams and no problem. If you always find yourself being stuck with bad teams, you are probably part of the problem. You're probably going to be expected to join voice chat and have certain Runelite plugins. I've included a link in the description that showcases all of the top plugins as of the release date of this video. Gear setups. Below you can find the four role beginner setups I've created, all wearing the same melee setup as you can now see on screen. For a blowpipe, dragon darts are preferred, but amethysts are acceptable for non-ranger roles. For Tebow's main should be using dragon arrows, and Iron Man can use amethyst arrows. It is not worth bringing an Avas or Avas assembler for any role except for range. This goes for Iron Man too, except that you're going to burn some arrows. The items you can see in red are those that can be binned when learning top, but you should quickly implement them back into your setup, and it's not preferred to do a lot of hard mode tops without these items. Again, the better you are, the better the teams you will find. If you don't have these items in your setup, this may block you from gaining access to the raid. Blood Fury Campin is acceptable, just don't bring it as a switch. You need to bring a three-way blowpipe switch or a two-way T-bow switch to avoid being drained at Maiden. A black chin also works. A Blood Fury counts as one of these switches if you elect to bring it over a torture. A face guard or Torva can be used over the Bandos and Serp that you saw in the setup earlier. A 48 max sit is very much preferred, so much so that I believe Torture Campin is better than Blood Fury Campin if it reduces your max hit. Setting up the team and general etiquettes. Learning in fours is recommended, and once proficient, fives becomes the favorable meta as it completes the raids faster and therefore leads to faster kits. Orb order will be as follows. The Major, or South Freeze, will be first in Orb Order. The Melee Freeze, or North Freeze, will be second. The Range will be third, and the Melee will be last. It's very important to have this Orb Order in place, as it will draw Maiden's Aggro in later. Pre-Pots will consist of what you see on the screen. Do not pre-pot a Divine Range and Potion. Pre-pot a regular Range and Potion. You are going to enter the raid at 121 HP after eating the Anglerfish. You can die two times and still have the same kit chance. If you die more than that, you need MVP points in the rooms to compensate. The raid is successful if your overall time beats the thresholds you can see on your screen. If the raid is slower than that, you can still get a purple, but you will not get the kits that everyone's looking after. Once you enter Maiden's Red Gate, the timer begins. The etiquette is now to go to the next room as soon as possible. This means not AFK in between rooms not going back for items you forgot, not AFK at chess. It is full speed ahead. With that said, let's go into Maiden. Maiden. For Maiden, it is very important to freeze and kill every single crab. If a crab goes in, it will increase her attack speed as well as her max hit and can summon additional blood spawns. The trails that these blood spawns leave behind are permanent and the spawns themselves can never be destroyed. You want to freeze them as soon as possible. I recommend the South Major freeze them as North will be covering threes and fours in most cases. Do not step in blood, it encourages more blood spawns. If you tank Maiden three hits in a row, her third hit and any future hits will take double the damage. The tank must rotate to prevent this and Majors must come in for a tank occasionally in learner teams. You will see a heat map on your screen now of how Maiden draws her aggro here in standard compass directions. The ranger's main job is to help with the proc, hit south one a bit, and then chin the clump. You want to make sure you're the proper distance away, and you want to make sure that you're range spotted. Melee's main job is to help with the proc, hit north one and north two. Major's main job is to freeze south one, south two, and south fours. You also want to be killing south one. They can also freeze blood spawns and draw Maiden's aggro a little bit more. It does not hurt to throw an additional ice barrage onto the clump as well. The clump must die. Melee freezers, or north majors, main job is to freeze north one, north two, north three, and yes, north four. 
you want to call out if late. And if you have spare time, you will help with the North 1, North 2 cleanup. In learner teams, it's a good idea to have both the North Major and the South Major freeze the 4s in Maiden. It will add extra damage, and it's really good practice for the North Major. Everyone will skip 30s, and this means you freeze the crabs and focus on Nuke and Maiden with the Crystal Halberd as your very last hit. Spec orders is as follows on the screen. It is important that everyone enters Maiden at the exact same time. This, this is accomplished by spam click the red gate. All rolls but uh, self freeze will spam the gate, and then the mage roll will enter. To be specific, the Malier and Rangers will dump one Dragon Warhammer without losing a tick. If you lose a tick by doing a bow entrance, don't Tebow pre-fire. Majors will lose one tick, usually by clicking on the Tebow tile, then Maiden. This sets them one tile behind and lets the BGSs land exactly one tick after the Dragon Warhammers. They do a backup BGS if Maiden is not zero defense. It is very important to get Maiden below 10 defense to maximize the chance of the skip being successful. It is not worth saving your spec for Dragon Claws. Get Maiden to zero defense. If all four BGSs do not reduce your defense to zero, the melee can then back up BGS. If you get good RNG, this, this exact setup will allow the me melee and the Ranger to have a D-Claw, and perhaps a Major will have one as well. Everyone will end up getting a Crystal Halberd spec at the very end of the fight, assuming proper Maiden times for learners. Upon Maiden's death, run back to the entrance, pick up your items, and go. Do not AFK here. If you left a potion behind in Maiden accidentally, leave it behind. You are wasting your team's time if you go back to pick it up. Bloat. The only changes of bloat are as follows. Meat will now fall from the ceiling at all times. He can turn now from two to four times, so it's best to let him chase you as opposed to you chasing him. Someone can BGS him on the start of each down. A run by is only recommended for advanced players. You want to crystal halberd him at the end of each down to finish. I recommend that you safe up, drink a brew, or eat some anglers if you have to. Tank in the Stomp is usually recommended for Bloat, but for Learner Hard Mode Top Teams, it is not recommended. A 3-down Bloat is acceptable, just don't fly your team. My recommendation is to constantly look at your feet while killing Bloat. You want to reduce your unnecessary movement when attacking him, just stare at your feet. Plan an exit and plan an entrance to Bloat. Do not just click Bloat or do not just click away to run away from him in AFK. You need to be constantly monitoring for fallen meat. When Bloat is dead, drop your salve, buy a stam immediately, this is everybody, and any remaining inventory slots can be brews or sharks. Don't overcomplicate this. If you spend more than three seconds at this chest, I will drown the puppy you see on your screen. Now let's talk about the Nyla Kiss. The Nyla Waves are identical to normal Tob, with only a few key differences. If you hit the Ron Nyla with the Ron style, you will take full recoil damage. This means you cannot rely on Ice Barrage or Chins without absolutely decimating yourself. So this means that Pillars Fallen is a lot more common. And finally, there are three Demi Bosses, which are either called Demis or Princes, that spawn at Waves 10, 20, and 30. Complete the Waves as normal, except when these Demi Bosses arrive. Prince 1 spawns on Wave 10 and can be identified as spawn in a few seconds after the lone major from the east side. Every roll except range will scythe and then crystal halberd this demi. Be super combated. Rangers will focus on chinitin the waves. After the chally, the major needs to get ready for the triple major wave and the ranger will go back to blowpiping. And the melees are now responsible for finishing off the demi if it survived. They will only attack it with range or melee as it is not worth spending the time to mage it. If it switches to mage, pray against it, kill something on the pillar, get back onto it when it changes to a proper style. For Prince 2, it spawns at wave 20 and can be identified by the third big major spawn. It will be an aggro that comes from the east. Everyone hits this demi boss with a scythe and a crystal halberd. And then finally, Prince 3 spawns at wave 30, and to be blunt, you simply ignore it until the end. Pray against it, focus on cleanup, prioritize low pillars. In the waves, it is still worth throwing an ice or a blood barrage and chins if you see several 
major or ranger nihilus clumps you will take some recoil damage from this but it is still good practice you have an inventory of yellow potion click it if a pillar is obviously going to get low and it's going to fall you need to either commit to saving it early or you need to accept the fact that it's going to fall and you want to focus on the other three surviving when this pillar falls you need to make sure you are very high hp during cleanup it is time to start eating to full. You want to enter the boss with 115 HP as a learner. This is a hard requirement if you're with a team of learners, as Nilos can be very much be a brick wall. For the Nilo boss, the Nilo boss is more punishing if you mess up and can wipe a whole team or an individual instantly, even at a high HP. Above all else, you must get your prayer correct and your movement correct, with the prayer being the most important factor. If you mess up your prayer here, you will wipe your team. You establish a DD tile. The ranger will never move from this tile. They stand still. Everyone else calls a location, usually either east, west, or north during cleanup. If the boss moves and this causes players to shift, the new DD is always the tile the ranger is currently on. The ranger never moves. Players adjust their position accordingly. When the boss changes to range, you must Prey range immediately and you need to separate from all other players. A separation will include a two tile gap or further to prevent the attack from splitting. If you're any closer, it will recoil to any player within that region. When the boss changes to mage, everyone needs to DD on the ranger. Note that you can pre-move to limit damage and maximize DPS. For example, if the Nilo boss is currently range, that means its next change can either be melee or mage. This means that you'd move to DD after the Nihilus second attack. If it's currently Mage, it can either be melee or range on the next phase. This means splitting up after the Nihilus second attack. And if it's current melee, you just need to dedicate two ticks to moving. You can pre-move in a sense by being one tile away from the DDD from the DD and quickly reacting, but you're just probably going to take some damage and lose some ticks here. Note that even in a good Nilo boss, where everyone does their job correctly, you are expected to take some damage, even if everyone's playing well. After Nilo's finish, it's time to start moving to Sotus Egg. While moving, call out your spec roll and location. For example, 1, 3, and E would be, I will spec phase 1, I will spec phase 3, and I will be northeast. Your location will now become your home for the remainder of the raid. Sotus Egg. Whatever corner you pick is your corner for the remainder of the raid. Call out your spec, call out your corner. Death Balls is one of the two change mechanics. He now fires two of them, and players without one camp the DD spot in front of Sotus Egg's head. Those who have a ball are going to alternate so that one is on the left of this DD and one is on the right of this DD. If both players on one side get it, whoever is closer to the DD spot will change to the other side. The people with the death balls cannot be touching. It will wipe the team. A ball will hit a 31 in a four man, and while you're tanking this, so to say, can melee a 23 through prayer. So you need to keep high HP, or you need to be a tile away from so to say. Most teams will split the first ball, unless everyone is low HP by then, somehow, and then they will tick eat any remaining balls. The other changed mechanic is the Sotus Egg Maze. What happens in hard mode top is one person stays up top and now everyone else is teleported down below. The path below splits into each, uh, a section for each of the teleported players and it goes in orb order. It is very important to go fast and accurate here. Things such as pings or voice communication can be really helpful here at the start, especially if it's a short maze, which is three tiles to the third row. In hard mode Tob, if the tornado touches someone, generally speaking, it will kill the team. The tornado that chases players down below can be summoned from two different ways. The first is that the person who's up top leaves the third row. This will summon the tornado both for the person up top, but also for the team down below. I recommend that whoever stays up top waits until their team is at least at the sixth row to give them more time. You will have time to catch up and you won't get lost even if you didn't memorize the path. Don't worry. Take your time if you're up top. The other way that the tornado can spawn is if the person down below who is last in orb order among the players there 
leaves that third row. So whoever is up top and whoever is last in orb order down low should both wait a moment before sending that maze to allow a buffer zone between the players and the tornadoes within the maze. Note that last in orb order means of the players down below. It is possible in a four man for the fourth player to be up top, meaning in that case, the third player is now last in orb order. Once Sodas Egg is dead, quickly buy stuff at the chest. This is often a huge time sink for learners. Keep it simple. Three restores and a lot of brews. If you have spare points, drop some brews, refill your inventory, and keep going. This process should take no more than five seconds. The other big thing is that you need at least three doses of stamina. If your stam potion has two doses, drop it and buy a new one. Do the math on your points while you run to the chest. Zarpus. Zarpus's defense is lower to 200, so players will do the same specs as they did in Maiden. Go to the same corner you were in for Sodas Egg. You have to melee Zarpus. For Zarpus P3, he looks at the direction that he was last hidden, meaning as long as you click him when he is not looking at you, you can sit there and AFK. During P3, figure out who is taking the staff, grab it quickly, and move on in. Verzik. As you enter Verzik's room, go to your corner, drop two brews, one restore, and then head to head to Verzik. A lot of teams lose time here trying to get everything right. Just go to your corner, drop your shit, and go. You should not be in your corner for more than two seconds. For Verzik P1, whenever she attacks the pillar, it causes rubble to fall down. Most teams do the pillar drop, also known as the 416 method. If you don't know what that is, you're probably doing it. Just alternate pillars. I've never seen both of these pillars fall in hundreds of hard mode top KC. If you forget to grab the staff uh, when it's your turn, just leave it. It will be there when you come back. It is not worth ragging both pillars. That can potentially wipe someone on your team. Verzik P2. For P2 Verzik, you will be in the same position as you were for Sodas Egg and Zarpus. You should always be praying range. Both the cabbages and the crabs will hit much harder. Bounces, along with the cabbage, and the poison that falls from that cabbage can stack you for a 60 very easily. Players will do a set pattern of a square as they attack P2. Use the, use the further tiles or the middle tile if you messed up or you need to just get back and cycle. You need to have mastered P2 scythe walk to competently do this. If you have crabs, just pay attention to where they are don't drag them into your teammates. Above all else, safe up. Do not rely on your blood fury. Everything hits harder. You can be wiped in a single tick here. Safe up, brew up for P2. Sometimes your teammate will pass lightning or path a crab to you. These things happen. Keep your HP high. Once crabs spawn, red crabs, it is expected that you should be healed to full and you should be super combated as you enter reds. It is important to have high DPS in reds. It will save a lot of time. So if you're low HP, brew up before you enter reds. If you got hit by a cabbage or stepped on a poison tile and you do not have a serpentine helm, click a sand view. Even if you're an Iron Man, it is worth bringing a sand view. This poison damage does add up significantly over the duration of the fight, and ideally, you're only going to use one or two doses. Verzik P3. Verzik, Verzik's mechanics are the same in that she attacks the same speed, she still does four autos between specials, and so on. If you want a good breakdown of this, check out uh, Settle's video in his final Swampletics series guide. The difference here with Versa P3 is that the crabs hit much harder and they will never explode over time. They either need to be procced by proximity or you need to click them with a trident or a saying. Please note that when they are green, you can actually click them with those magic weapons and it will kill them when they're blue. The crabs must die. It is okay to get off Versa for a second to take care of them. If you're really confident in your skills, what you can do is you can just let them come close to you and then run away. For Verzik, the tank can pass at any times. You need to be ready for it, especially in the transition between specials. Everyone must make webs. Most players will 
care and not proc tornadoes until after yellow spawn. It is recommended to lure Verzik to the throne to allow for clear sight lines of yellows. At yellows, a set of three yellows will spawn in either the corners or in the center. Take the three in your corner. If your corner's yellows do not spawn, you go to the center ones. Above all else for yellows, you need to trust your team. Stick to your own yellows no matter what. Never take someone else's yellows. If someone somehow died and you're left with three or fewer players, you need to communicate what is happening after webs but before yellows. For example, first an orb border can take the westernmost yellows. The second an orb border can take the center. Third can take the east yellows. You can use the image as you see here for reference. Either way, if you're potted with randoms, there is no formal agreement for what happens in this situation. You need to communicate with your team before yellows spawn to figure out what's happening here. If someone dies pre-yellows and the team does not accommodate this, to this fact, it can cause wipes due to poor communication. It is at this point you should have grabbed all of your remaining brews on the ground. I would recommend Brew Super Combatin for the duration of P3 if you know what that is. I have put a guide in the description if you'd like to learn. It's a really good way to maximize DPS. Once yellows are done, you enter the most important part of the raid. This next minute that will happen will be what makes or breaks the raid. It is here that the team will either finish or they will wipe, and you are much more likely to, to complete the raid if you follow three key guidelines. Rule number one, never ever heal. Lose ticks if you need to. Run away from Versic if you need to. Do not fucking heal. There's one exception to this that I'll talk about later. Rule number two, you need to pass that green ball once. It doesn't need to get passed more. Rule number three, make webs. This is the one exception where healing is okay. Sit on that web tile as you're prepared for Versic to come. If you tank a heal, so be it. If you follow these three steps to completion, you will get the, the kill. So first off, what's going to happen here after yellows and players start getting on Verzik? One, the tornado is going to spawn, and this is where her HP falls below 20%. This tornado, if it hits you, will take 50% of your current HP, and it will heal her for three times whatever it hits you. So if you're at 100 HP, it's going to heal her for 150 HP. That is going to be a very long time to recoup that damage. If you are a learner and you heal a bunch of times, you will wipe your raid. Because when you heal, not only does it substantially increase her HP pool, it also increases her max hit and her accuracy. So she will hit you harder and more accurately. After yellows, you have the green ball. This green ball will kill whoever it lands on unless it is passed. Once this is passed, it turns into a regular green ball, which does 74 damage. Any further passes will reduce the damage by about 25 damage each time, but it is only worth passing it more than once if you see that whoever is currently on is going to die otherwise. It is not worth tanking a heal to try and pass the ball around to reduce it by 20 damage or so. Whoever gets it past them, just run away, tank the 74. I recommend that after tornado spawn, you keep your HP at around 60. This way you can quickly brew up to 74 if the green ball is on you, and healing will be less punishing. Do not sit at 100 HP and constantly heal throughout the raid. Around this time, Verzik will have reached 5% HP. She will then heal an additional 30%. The specials now repeat as well. Crabs will spawn, they must die. Get off the boss, pull out your magic weapon, and kill them. Once the crabs are dead, be prepared to make webs. It is okay to heal here as long as you make webs. This is why after the crabs spawn, you should stop clicking your brew and you should super combat. If you do heal, you heal less. Make sure you're prepared for webs. As you can see in the clip right here, I'm in a very high HP. I don't want to heal, but I still need to make webs. I got off the boss early. I lured my tornado extremely far away, and I anticipated that after the fourth attack, I need to move to the web tile. So that's also another strategy that you can work out. If you're very high HP and don't want to tank the tornado, you should just lure it around instead, and then just make webs then. Versic should die 
uh, during or shortly after the second webs. Um, if you're all learners, let's talk about what happens if things keep going though. After webs, you will have yellows. The combination of yellows and the purple tornadoes is what I refer to as the team wiper. If handled poorly, the raid is over. Trust your team to go to their yellows and lure your tornado very, very far away. So much to the point that it is uncomfortable. It's okay to tank one of those yellows. Just tank a hit, but do not heal. If you heal at this point in the game and your HP is fairly high during that heal, you've probably just cost the entire team the raid. Heal and will wipe your team at this point. Tank one of the yellows. If you need to, draw your tornado far away. Communicate. If someone has died at this point, you need to communicate who's going where for webs. If you don't, this can also really commonly wipe your team. I've seen it happen a lot. So you need to be communicating who goes where if you proceed to the second set of yellows. If you've stuck to this criteria, Verzik should be dead by the second whips though. And even if she isn't, not healing and handling yellows properly will guide your team to success. There's a lot more in-depth strategies um, than what you've seen covered in this video. Uh, you can learn about those later on using other resources. The purpose of this guide was just to give you an entrance into TOB and just get you competent enough so that you're realistically not going to troll your team. You can enter with a couple of less requirements than this and you can get completions, but because the learning community is so small, uh, you don't want to be excluded. So I would say really just make sure you spend some time get your foundation in place that way you're able to flourish once you go to hard mode top there are a couple of individuals uh, who shall not be named who have gathered a reputation as essentially just being a complete anchor for their team even though they have lots of kc because they have zero foundations you don't want to be that person uh, if you have any questions just head yourself over to the ouija raids discord you can leave a comment um, there's lots of resources out there to be able to use otherwise good luck in your rating good luck in your kits hopefully you get that dust